Hello and welcome to week four of THEO 235, American Christianity. This is the lecture for week four, the first of two recorded lectures for, uh, for this week. Each recording will be approximately uh, one hour. Um, in week four, I'm going to be discussing the American Christianity from the time of Reconstruction immediately after the Civil War until World War I. So we're going to cover the period from 1865-1866 until roughly 1918. During this first lecture I'm going to uh, address the following uh, topics just so you can uh, take note of that. I'm going to be addressing the issue of Reconstruction and then we're going to specify that even more by talking about um, the rise of the black churches during Reconstruction and afterwards, the status of the white churches after the Civil War, the rise of cities in America, the golden age of liberal theology, and then the social gospel. I think that is going to take roughly uh, uh, an hour. If it takes a little bit longer than an hour, then the second video will be uh, shorter than an hour. You may be seeing uh, contrasts in the light. We have a skylight in the, in the room where I'm making this recording, and since Hurricane Isaac is coming through, uh, the, 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 the sun is out and then the sun is uh, back uh, under the clouds. So um, I hope you can see and even more so, I hope you can hear, because you don't need to see me. In fact, you probably don't want to see me in order to hear this lecture. So, let's begin. The period of Reconstruction. The period Reconstruction is considered that period of time after the Civil War from 1865 until more or less 1877, with the uh, election of President Rutherford P. Hayes. It is that period of time in which the North, the, the former Union, um, attempted to reconstruct, hence the name, to rebuild the South economically uh, and, and politically. It also refers to uh, that period of time uh, in which there was an attempt made to make the uh, the, the the end of slavery uh, a permanent. As we'll see, or as you know already, that did not happen. Um, one form of slavery, legal slavery, was replaced as a result of Reconstruction by uh, a new system, the, G the Jim Crow system of uh, economic uh, and social slavery. So, with that, let me begin. The North and South, even after the Civil War, remained deeply divided, as you probably could imagine. It was the desire of the South to return to its old system as much as possible. It was an agrarian system rather than an urban system. It was a system uh, predicated on legal slavery. Well, that was not going to continue. At the same time, the Northern radicals, the Reconstruction radicals, wanted as much as possible to destroy the system of the Old South, to do away with it completely, not just slavery, but the old Southern uh, way of life. In the early years after the war, the momentum for uh, equality between blacks and whites led to the passage of three amendments to the Constitution. The 13th Amendment is the amendment that formally abolished uh, slavery in America. The 14th Amendment um, forbade the denial of rights to anyone on the basis of their race, on the basis of their color. Um, and the 15th Amendment guaranteed the right of all citizens um, to vote. Of course, that means that meant then all male citizens because women still did not have the right to vote. Women would not obtain or secure the right to vote until 1920. 
Now, keep in mind that even though these three uh, amendments to the Constitution were passed, um, that it, it, it was not enforced. They were not enforced. As you may know already, blacks did not uh, secure, truly secure the right to vote until the mid-1960s. The passage of an amendment to the Constitution was not enough to guarantee the rights of, uh, of African Americans uh, to vote in this country. For, over, for, for approximately another 100 years, African Americans were denied their basic civil rights, the basic civil liberties um, in this country. The Civil War brought to an end legal slavery. It did not end the oppression of blacks in America. Okay, Northern troops occupied the southern, the former southern or confederate states until 1877. And northerners, and these are people who were referred to by uh, the people of the south as carpetbaggers, came down into the south and were elected to uh, certain offices in the southern states. As you can imagine, the southerners didn't really care for this, <laughs> this system of northern people coming in and winning elective office in the South. This continued until 1877. Uh, as I said, President Hayes um, was elected in 1876. He, when he was inaugurated, he withdrew the Union troops and it didn't take very long for the Old South to reemerge. Okay? Now, even though legal slavery was no longer in place, as I've already said, um, black people in the South were, continued to be held down by a system of laws that prevented them from participating in any meaningful way in the democratic process. It also prevented them from, from participating in any meaningful way in the economic and social life of the South. For example, many uh, former slaves in the South uh, continued to farm on the, the, the former plantations, this time as sharecroppers. The system of sharecropping was inherently unfair because um, blacks did not own the land on which they farmed and they were required to, as payment for the right to farm the land to give most of what the uh, yield was from that crop to the white owner. It was uh, a legal and yet oppressive form of, uh, of economic life. As you know from your reading of history, blacks were systematically denied other rights, the right to uh, eat in, uh, white, in restaurants, white restaurants, to uh, stay in hotels, uh, had to travel in the in the back of uh, back of the train car, eventually in the back of the in the back of the bus, um, and so there, there the as I, as I've already said, the system of legal slavery was replaced by a system of economic, social, and cultural slavery called the Jim Crow system, that kept. Um, black people from assuming their rightful place in American um, society. Okay. The end of the Civil War saw the rise of the black churches. Before the Civil War, the organization of black churches was either prohibited or discouraged um, for the most part. And this was true especially in the South. The white slave owners did not want blacks to be able to meet together or to organize in, in any way. And so they, had, they tore apart families and they uh, forbade, for the most part, blacks from organizing um, into churches. Okay? Um, only before the war, only the Baptists and the Methodists uh, made any real effort to evangelize the slaves. Okay. The system of revivals um, helped convert many of the slaves to Christianity. Sidney Alstrom notes that, and this is a quote, revivalistic 
Protestant Christianity became the chief means by which the African slave, whose native culture, language, and religion were taken away, defined and explained their personal and social existence in America. Evidence for this is found in the lyrics of the Negro spirituals, which framed the black experience in biblical terms of liberation and putting up with suffering. If you're at all familiar with the Negro spirituals, you know that they uh, expound the theme of liberation, uh, a, a spiritual like, um, let my people go. When Israel was in Egypt land, let my people go. Um, and, and, and they went to the Pharaoh and said, Moses went to the Pharaoh and said, let my people go. That imagery of slavery and liberation from slavery resonated deeply in the minds and hearts of the former slaves. There was in the Negro spirituals also a profound tone of hope that even though the situation at the present time uh, was oppressive and it was terrible and it caused tremendous suffering, there was hope that things could be better and that God could and would make things better for the, farm, for, for the farmer slaves. After the Civil War, black churches were allowed to organize. But what happened is that um, there were not uh, integrated churches. Rather, the black churches spun off into their own congregations and even into their own uh, conferences and synods. And so you had, for example, the colored Primitive Baptists, the colored Cumberland Presbyterian Church, the colored Presbyterian Church, the colored Methodist Episcopal Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, um, a, a a denomination which is still in existence today. At first, the black churches helped the cause of the radical Reconstructionists. They, along with the radical Reconstructionists, wanted to do away with the old southern system completely, do away with their, with their way of life. But over time, and as the North became tired of the Reconstruction effort, um, the, uh, the black churches became less and less a symbol of reform and change and more and more a symbol of the segregation that permeated the South. And so, you know, as we know, there, there grew up separate black and white congregations in virtually every denomination. Uh, you may have heard at one time or another the old uh, saying that uh, Sunday is the most segregated day of the week. That became the case after the Civil War. It, and in some ways, sadly, it's still the case in, uh, it, 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 in American religion. It's still the case that there are more often than not uh, either all black or all white congregations and not that many truly integrated congregations. But even though they stood as a symbol of uh, systemic segregation in the South, the black churches were hugely important in the lives of the black community. Um, Alstrom says this, that after the Civil War, quote, the church was by far the most important black institution after the family. And so while the family became the primary social institution uh, for black people after the Civil War, um, the church was second in importance as far as, as institutions. The churches encouraged economic cooperation. In other words, the churches said, um, go to you know, the, the, the grocery store run by the, the, the black man use black institutions. So it encouraged cooperation among uh, African Americans. Um, the churches also published influential um, journals, uh, published the writings of influential black pastors and other black intellectuals, and uh, also um, helped greatly in the education of blacks. 
black people after the, the Civil War um, were placed in segregated and inferior schools. You know perhaps about the, the, uh, the, the, Supreme, Court, the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which um, institutionalized a two-tiered public education system by saying that um, as, uh, as long as, well, it, it said that there could be two different public school systems, but they needed to be separate. They could be separate, but they needed to be equal. Well, they were separate, all right, but they were never equal. And it wasn't until 1954 with, the, uh, with another Supreme Court case, Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, that um, public education in America was supposed to start uh, becoming more equal. Uh, sadly, even today, um, our public school system uh, it isn't, isn't truly equal, but that, that's for another day. Okay, and so uh, my point here is that the black churches helped in the education of black children uh, by not only teaching them Sunday school, but also teaching them reading, by teaching them writing, by teaching, you know, all kinds of things. Okay. In the black churches, the paramount role, the most important role was taken on by the pastor. The pastor was the figure uh, in the black churches. He was a leader. He was a politician. In other words, he lobbied for his congregation. He was a boss in the sense of the old political bosses of the, uh, uh, of, of the cities. Um, he was an intriguer. He was an idealist. And he was um, a leader of worship. The trouble is, all too often, uh, sad to say, the black pastors gave in too easily to the demands of, of whites, um, even when it was to the detriment of their own congregations. All too often, um, the black pastors um, simply gave in when, when uh, the whites in town threatened them, um, they gave in. Uh, white people had a tremendous amount of leverage, uh, real and perceived, over black people. Um, it was true that there were killings, there were lynchings, that um, it, it, if a black person um, was uh, arrested for a crime, it was almost a certainty that he or she would be uh, convicted. Uh, because the jury of their peers, and here's my quotation marks, the jury of their peers was uh, almost, in every case, uh, a, a group of, of white people. A group of white people who uh, were deeply prejudiced against the uh, person on the stand. Uh, and so um, the pastors, uh, rather than uh, fight against the injustice that was that was taking place, more often than not, sadly, chose not to fight. Um, you, I don't know if you know this, but even in the 1950s, when Martin Luther King was advocating nonviolent um, advocacy for, uh, for, for civil rights for African Americans, there were a number of black pastors who opposed him and who said, no, we need to just uh, move more slowly. We need to just assimilate and kind of go along and eventually, eventually we'll, we'll be accepted. Eventually we'll catch up. And Dr. King said, um, no, we've waited long enough. Uh, blacks in America have waited long enough to, to get their equality. Now it's time to go out and fight for it. But fight in a nonviolent way. Do keep that in mind, uh, that even in the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, Dr. King's, uh, Dr. King's method was not unanimously accepted, uh, and, and, and the black pastors were, not all of them, but some of them were the group, one of the groups that, uh, that opposed them, that opposed him. Okay, I jumped ahead a little bit, but by the end of the 19th century, by the end of the 1800s, um, it, is, it is fair to say that the situation of African Americans in America was at an all-time low. Um, 
as low as low or lower than it had been during the time of, of legal slavery because um, b blacks had to now you know try to make it on their own in a system in a culture that systematically systematically denied them their rights even though they their rights were secured by law they were not secured uh, in reality okay so now what about the white churches after the Civil War well uh, a as you can imagine in most cases the white churches were used um, as an instrument to enforce segregation and uh, to reinforce white dominance okay um, e even though these these congregations were Christian nominally Christian there was still a tremendous amount of uh, race prejudice and the churches were used to reinforce uh, the Jim Crow system at this time the three most popular denominations were the Methodist the Baptist and the Presbyterian and even though they had harbored black members during the war once the war ended they encouraged their black members to go out and form their own congregations I guess that's not too surprising but that's what happened the Catholic Church now I've been speaking about the Protestant churches but the Catholic churches in the north and, and the south reunited after the Civil War during the Civil War they had re, uh, remained separated from each other and there were Catholics who were um, in support of the Union and there were Catholics who were in support of the Confederacy there were chaplains on both sides there were chaplains who were ministering to the Union soldiers and there were chaplains who were ministering to the Confederate soldiers in other words there was a huge rift within Catholicism during the Civil War after the Civil War these uh, the church in the south and the church in the, in the north reunited they were all Catholic uh, after all but this is what happened first thing um, blacks in the south and in the north were never truly evangelized by the Catholic Church um, to this day there are not many uh, African-American uh, uh, Catholics in, in the United States um, second the uh, blacks who were um, evangelized who were converted to Catholicism either had to do one of two things they either had to form their own church their own congregations just like the Protestant uh, denominations did or the Protestant congregations or they had to sit either in the choir loft or in the back of the Catholic Church so there was pretty much the same kind of systemic systematic um, uh, prejudice against black Catholics as there was against uh, black Protestants being a black person in America was not a good thing during the second half of the uh, 19th century okay now the next thing I want to talk about um, the the growth of cities the explosion really of cities in America after the Civil War just to give you one example and I could give you half a dozen more but this will make my point to give you one example in 1833 the city of Chicago was incorporated as a city 1833 when it incorporated as a city it had exactly 17 residential units 17 one seven by 1900 the city of Chicago had a population of 1.7 million people that is just one example of the growth of cities uh, in, in the second half of the uh, of the 19th century the city of st. Louis I did not look it up at the at the end of the Civil War I want to say that the population of the city of st. Louis was about 300,000 at the end of the Civil War by 1900 the population of the city not city and county but the city of st. Louis was about 850,000 it was one of the top 10 cities in the United States it hosted the World's Fair in 1904 
Today, the population of the city of St. Louis in the year 2012 is about 340,000. So it has uh, grown tremendously and it has, has also declined tremendously. Um, but this story of, about uh, huge growth is repeated over and over again in the major cities, uh, especially of the north, in Philadelphia and New York and Detroit um, and Boston and Cincinnati and, and on and on and on. The primary reason for this, or I should say reasons, are two. Number one, the cities became industrialized after the Civil War. Um, gradually, the uh, United States began to shift from a primarily agrarian society, although it was still predominantly uh, agrarian in 1900, uh, 1900. It began to shift to a more um, manufacturing-based economy after the Civil War. That's number one. Number two, there was a tremendous influx of immigrants to the cities. In the years between uh, 1860 and 1900, some 14 million uh, people immigrated to the United States from other countries, primarily from Southern and Eastern Europe, between 1860 and 1900, 14 million people. Between 1900 and 1920, another 14 million people immigrated to the United States. So there was a huge influx of people from other countries into this country. Um, the United States has had a love-hate relationship with immigrants almost since the beginning, even though um, virtually all of us uh, are, are immigrants. Uh, the United States, when, when it needs labor, when the United States needs labor, it opens the, the doors and people come into this country from, from other countries. When it doesn't need, uh, uh, you know, when it doesn't need the work, when it doesn't need labor, um, it becomes very hostile to uh, to immigration. It, it, it's it's just the way it has been. Right now, as you know, work is scarce in the United States, and so there's uh, a lot of hostility to uh, to immigrants. Okay. At the same time, at the same time that the cities were growing and as the manufacturing sector was growing, the owners of these manufacturing companies, the owners of corporations, wielded tremendous power over the lives of workers. There was no real union movement at this time. There were guilds for uh, certain types of, of, uh, of uh, craftspersons, but there were there was there were not labor unions at this time. What does that mean? That means that the individual worker is pretty much at um, the mercy of the owner of the corporation, and so. Um, there is no concern whatsoever about the length of working hours, the length of the workday. Um, there's no concern about wages. There's no concern about worker safety. There's no concern about worker benefits. There's no such thing as health insurance, for example. There's no such thing as, as a pension. And if I were a worker and went to the boss and said, you know, this is wrong, um, you know, children are working in here who are, you know, 10 years old and they're working 12 hours a day and, and their wage isn't fair and uh, they're being hurt and maimed and, and, and dying in these factories. Uh, the owner of the factory simply would have said, well, get out. Well, I'll find somebody else. In fact, I'll find, fi I'll find 500 other people who are willing to do what you're doing. So get out of my sight. Workers had virtually no power. They were at the mercy of uh, the corporate uh, the corporate owners. Okay, um, as the cities began to, to to burgeon in growth, as they grew up very uh, so quickly after the Civil War, um, remember that the greatest number of these uh, new immigrants were Catholic. And so uh, the cities, the major cities of the United States became more Catholic and as a result, the Protestant churches began to move outside the core cities, and as a consequence, these new Americans, these um, new uh, immigrants, um, lost contact, or really never had any contact, contact with uh, Protestantism.
and there's my phone, which I'm not going to answer. Still at all, there were Protestant um, initiatives after uh, the Civil War. Um, Protestants tried to reach out and help um, those who were suffering in, in the cities. How did they do this? They did this through um, the Sunday School movement. Uh, for those Protestants who were still in the cities, they started the, we're all familiar with the Sunday School movement, that a movement whereby um, the children would attend classes, Bible classes, uh, classes teaching them about their particular uh, denomination. That happened. There was the growth of the YMCA and the YWCA. YMCA stands for Young Men's Christian Association. Uh, YWCA, Young Women's Christian Association. It, this was an attempt to improve the lives of people, Protestants, in the cities by uh, helping them improve their bodies. By improving their bodies, by staying in shape, the, the, the belief was they could also improve their souls, that they would be more well-rounded people all the way. And, uh, and the other initiative that took place in the cities by the Protestants after the Civil War was the beginning of the Salvation Army. This was for the truly indigent people. The, the Salvation Army fed people, clothed people, um, had, had shelters uh, for people uh, to spend the night or to spend a period of time until they could get back on their feet. Okay? Um, still, the greatest... Protestant initiative after the Civil War was none of these. It wasn't the Sunday schools. It wasn't the YMCA or the YWCA. And it wasn't the Salvation Army. It was uh, the revival movement. Recall that I said in weeks past that the revival movement was, um, ha has been, even before the United States uh, won the Revolutionary War, was one of the primary ways by which Americans uh, were evangelized and converted to uh, one of the Protestant denominations. The revivals continued um, in the cities and in the, country, in the countryside all over. Some of the names associated with the revival movement, Dwight Moody, Ira Sankey, S-A-N-K-E-Y, and Billy Sunday. In week five, I believe it is, um, I'm going to show you some actual footage. There is actual footage on YouTube of, uh, of Billy Sunday. He was a fiery speaker, and, and it's kind of interesting to, to see him. We'll watch just a couple of minutes about Billy Sunday. So, that's all I have to say about the rise of the cities in America after the Civil War. My next topic is um, the golden age of liberal theology. That's liberal theology within Protestantism. Let me first describe liberal theology. Let me uh, talk about some of the characteristics of liberal theology. There are uh, six of them, okay, just for those who are keeping count, and I hope you are. Uh, there are six characteristics of liberal Protestant theology. The first one, it was open to divergent opinions. It, it was open to uh, uh, many, many different points of view and it promoted intellectual freedom. So if one were a part of the liberal movement, um, you, a, a believer could think in a number of, of different ways. There was not a prescribed uh, set of uh, beliefs that, that had to be adhered to. Um, People, the, the, the liberal movement uh, promoted intellectual freedom among Protestantism. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how in just a few minutes. That's the first characteristic. Second characteristic is that it, it took a highly rational rather than an emotional approach to religion. Uh, in other words, it became a religion of the mind rather than a religion of the heart. Evangelical Protestantism had always focused more on the heart, that one should believe, should be secure in one's own heart and, and, and soul that, that he or she is saved. And um, evangelical Protestantism always fostered more emotional manifestations or expressions of religion. 
the liberal movement um, believed more in a, a thoughtful, uh, calmer, cooler form of, of Protestantism, one that focused on right thinking rather than right feeling. That's the second characteristic. The third was the desire to free Christianity from its outdated creeds, its outdated um, statements of belief, okay, and to open, it, it may make Protestantism more uh, in tune with the times, more in tune with the 19th century. All right. The fourth uh, characteristic was an emphasis on human freedom. Remember, in that um, tension between freedom, the human freedom, and God's divine predestination, which has been uh, a tension within uh, Protestantism um, since day one in America, um, the, the emphasis on human freedom is known as Arminianism. Arminianism. I'm sure I've talked about that in a previous lecture. I haven't given that lecture yet, but I'm sure I will. So liberal Protestantism uh, gave greater emphasis to human freedom as well as human nature's natural capacity for altruism. In other words, the, the liberal movement believed in the innate goodness of the human person rather than the innate depravity of the human uh, person. That depravity which was so much a part of evangelical uh, Protestantism, so much a part of evangelical Christianity. Remember that evangelical Christianity was uh, the, the, the successor to people like John Calvin, uh, St. Augustine, and even St. Paul. And so it placed greater emphasis on human depravity, uh, stating that human beings are sinful from birth, sinful by nature. And now the liberal Protestant movement is saying, no, no, let's not look at the third chapter of Genesis in which Adam and Eve sin. Let's instead look at chapter 1 of Genesis in which uh, God says when he finishes creating, God says, Everything that I have made is good. And after the creation of the man and woman, he even says, everything that I have made is very good. The liberal movement fo focused more on the innate goodness of human nature, on the innate um, capacity for human beings to do good to each other, to be good to each other, rather than human nature's innate depravity and sinfulness. Okay? All right, um, that's number four. Number five, there was a, a strong emphasis on um, moral preaching and action. The liberal Protestant uh, preachers um, stressed uh, the, the moral uh, imperative of Christians to go out into the world and do good, that it's not enough just to be content with one's, within one's own mind and heart that I am saved and that therefore everything is okay. The liberal Protestant movement told its believers that if they really believe, they have to go out into the world and show it. They have to be good to other people. It's not enough just to feel saved within oneself. Um, you have to go out and you have to show it. And the preachers within the liberal movement stressed the moral imperative, uh, that, that moral imperative, to go out and do good. We will see in just a few minutes that the social gospel movement would stress this um, even more. It would take liberal Protestantism uh, even further. Okay, and number six. Within the liberal movement, there was minimal attention paid to ritual and sacraments. Okay, um, there really was, well, there, there was a certain amount of uh, attention to ritual within the uh, evangelical movement, but within the liberal movement, there was even less stress on ritual and sacrament. There was more um, emphasis placed on action, on action in the world, okay, on morality, on, on good ethics. All right, so those are the six openness to divergent opinions and a desire for uh, intellectual freedom, 
a highly rational rather than emotional approach to religion. That's number two. Number three, um, a desire to free Christianity from outdated belief systems, outdated creeds. Four, an emphasis on human freedom, Arminianism, uh, over, um, over a divine predestination, and a, a, accompanied by a belief in humanity's natural capacity for goodness. That's four. Number five, a strong emphasis on moral preaching and moral action. And number six, very little attention paid to ritual and sacraments. Okay. Now, liberal uh, Protestantism, liberal Protestant theology, challenged traditional Protestant thinking in a number of important areas. As a matter of fact, in three different areas. First of all, in its approach to creation and evolution. I'm sure you're aware that the traditional Protestant approach to creation was to accept uh, word for word the story of creation as it was told in the book of Genesis. The liberal Protestants said, no, that's not necessarily uh, the case, that uh, because of the findings of Charles Darwin, and Darwin's books now had been out for a while, for about 30 years or so, they began to, to believe that um, e even though they accepted that creation was by God, they also ex accepted or came to believe in Darwin's a theory of natural selection and evolution. And so um, they embraced Darwin and rejected the Genesis stories of creation. And that doesn't mean that they were atheists. It just means that they um, accepted evolution rather than what's now referred to as creationism. Okay, so that was their first uh, challenge to um, traditional Protestantism. The second, their second challenge to traditional Protestantism was in the interpretation of Scripture. Mm. Traditional Protestantism, traditional evangelical Protestantism, had always accepted the literal inerrancy of the Bible. In other words, that every word contained in the Bible is literally true. That it is literally the Word of God and so therefore every word and every syllable is literally factually true. Now ever since the late 18th century, ever since the late 1700s beginning in Germany, there had uh, flourished uh, a, a new way of looking at the scriptures and of interpreting the scriptures. And uh, it, it came to be known as the historical critical, historical critical, or historical critical um, interpretation of the scriptures. What these people did was to was two things. They looked at the scriptures in light of the historical context of the times, and so they examined the scriptural stories and then looked at other evidence, historical, archaeological, anthropological evidence, to see if the biblical stories squared with uh, the, the findings of archaeology and anthropology. And so, for example, they came to uh, challenge the, uh, the story of Genesis as being literally true, because there, there is no um, Garden of Eden. I mean, people have speculated about where there could have been a Garden of Eden, uh, but there, but there was no Garden of Eden. Um, there, there was no uh, Noah's Ark. Um, when they looked in Egypt for evidence that uh, of the plagues, uh, for evidence of uh, you know a, a massive uh, out migration of people away from Egypt they couldn't find any. And so they began to um, say that perhaps the biblical stories were not historical or factual as much as they focused on the religious meaning of the stories. 
The second thing that they did, uh, the first one was to look at the, the scriptural stories in their historical context. The second thing that they did was to examine the Bible as a work of literature like any other work of literature, like the Aeneid or like uh, the works of, of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Okay? And, and take it apart. Look at the vocabulary. Look at the syntax. Look at the grammatical structure. Look at uh, you know all all kinds of things. And they began to uh, notice, for example, that books like Genesis or Exodus were could not have been the work of Moses because they found um, distinct. Uh, literary uh, styles, different vocabulary, different way of forming sentences, um, different names for God, different names for mountains. Um, Mount Sinai was called in, in some moments, in some of the stories, Mount Sinai, and in other stories, Mount Horeb. They're exactly the same mountain. They have very different names. They uh, began to, to, to look at that and say that um, perhaps the uh, scriptures, well, let's say the, the Pentateuch, the first five, five books of the Bible, were not written by Moses, that they were um, written by a, a series of authors, two or three or four or more, and that the, um, the Bible evolved over a, a number of centuries. Okay, So the liberal movement in embracing this kind of historical, critical, um, interpretation of scripture challenged the position of traditional Protestantism that said that every word of scripture um, is literally true. Okay. Um, the third way they challenged the theology of traditional Protestantism was by their um, embracing, or at least not the embracing, but the examination of other world religions. Their study of the other world religions, Judaism and Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism, etc., led them to the conclusion that perhaps, perhaps Christianity was not the one true religion, that there is more than one path to God, um, and that all these different paths, the Hindu path, the Buddhist path, the Islamic path, um, should all be considered valid. That Christianity um, should not be considered the only way to God or the only right way to God. So you can see that in these three areas in, the, uh, in their views toward creation and evolution, in their view about the interpretation of scripture, and in their study of the comparative religions that the liberal Protestant movement challenged traditional evangelical Protestantism. Okay? In some ways, that conflict continues even today. All right. And the last thing I want to talk about during this first part of the week four lecture, remember there are two uh, of these uh, scintillating lectures, the last thing I want to talk about is the social gospel movement. The social gospel movement within Protestantism. Uh, I want to talk first of all about what it is and what its characteristics are. And in this case, um, there are four characteristics. Okay, so what is it? Characteristic number one. The social gospel is a movement within the liberal Protestant movement. It is an outgrowth of the liberal Protestant movement. So it wasn't in opposition to it. It just took it in a different direction. Okay? Um, where it differs primarily with the liberal movement is that um, it called for social action. Remember I said that the liberal movement also called for social action, but it called for it more on the level of person to person. The social gospel called upon Christians to engage in social action for the transformation of uh, America uh, and for the transformation of the world. So it viewed uh, social action and the moral imperative in a broader context. Okay? Not just person to person, not just me to you, not just me feeding you or clothing you or housing you, but 
me working with others to change the world, to change America and to change the world. Okay? So, in a nutshell, that's what the social gospel movement is. That's characteristic number one. Char characteristic number two, it was a form of millennial thought. We've talked about millennialism before. Millennialism is that kind of uh, Christian thinking, or really any kind of religious thinking, that divides history into particular eras or ages. And it normally um, identifies those eras or ages in religious terms. The era of the Father, the era of the Son, the era of the Holy Spirit, the, the era of the Old Testament, the New Testament, okay? Things like that. So the kind of millennialism fostered by the social gospel um, said this, they believed that a new day was at hand for the church and for America, that a new age was about to begin and that they were responsible for ushering it in. And in this new age, the kingdom of evil, um, as personified by the corporations, as personified by a number of different things, by all the evils in America, that the kingdom of evil must be overcome by the kingdom of God. Sadly, the kingdom of evil did not include, to a very great extent, uh, race prejudice in America. Uh, 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 you know, that's just the way it was. Um, so it believed that the social gospel people were in the midst of ushering in a new, a new age in American life, a new age that would do away with the kingdom of evil and would usher in the kingdom of God. Remember that Christianity itself was a kind of millennialism or a kind of eschatological movement. Jesus believed that a new age was coming, that a new day was coming. The primary theme of his preaching was the reign of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. And when he said that, he meant that the age of the Romans, the age of oppression, the kingdom of evil was about to come to an end and that a new age, the reign of God, was already being ushered in by his own presence, by Jesus' own presence. That uh, reign of God would be characterized by four things, by open healing, by shared meals, by wandering, not settling down anywhere, and by fundamental equality. So that's another example of uh, a millennialist and eschatological uh, movement. Jesus' movement was eschatological. It believed that a final age, the final age, the reign of God, was about to be ushered in. The social gospel people, 1900 years later, uh, preached somewhat the same thing, that the reign of God, a new age, was about to begin. The final age, as a matter of fact, of God was about to be ushered in and the kingdom of evil was about to be done away with. Along with the liberals, the social gospel people firmly believed in the goodness of human nature, not the depravity, not the innate sinfulness of human nature, but that human nature is good, that people are naturally good. They adopted the view, as I said before, in Genesis 1, that when God looked upon everything that God had made, God saw that it was good, and that includes human nature. And so they focused on the innate um, altruistic or good goodness of, of uh, human beings. Um, that's number three. N uh, number four, they, um, th they, they preached the moral demand that humanity should break the bonds of evil through religious faith and moral strength. Okay, so to repeat those four characteristics of the social gospel. Number one, it was a movement within liberal Protestantism um, where it differed with liberal Protestantism is that it called for social action, action to change society rather than one-on-one -on -one action. Number two, it was a kind of millennial thought or eschatological thought. It, began, it believed in a new age, the ushering in of, of uh, a new age, that the kingdom of evil was about to come to an end and that the reign of God, the kingdom of God, would be ushered in, a kingdom of justice and goodness and, and righteousness. 
Third, it believed in the innate goodness of human nature rather than human depravity and, and fundamental sinfulness. And four, it, it preached the moral demand that humanity needed to break the bonds of evil in the world through religious faith and through moral strength. Okay, the social gospel grew up in reaction to the way that the American economic system was evolving. The American economic system, as I've already described, was moving in the direction of laissez-faire capitalism. Let me spell laissez-faire. It's a French word. L-A-I-S-S-E-Z hyphen F-A-I-R-E. Laissez-faire. That simply means let it happen. Just let things happen as they, as they will. Uh, in, other, in other words, a true, a true free enterprise um, system in which government has little or no interference. Okay, that was the case in the second half of the 19th century. The, uh, the super rich, what we would call today the 1%, really control the economy. Of, uh, of the United States. If you've ever visited places like um, Newport, Rhode Island, uh, my wife and I have, and you will see there, if you ever go there, you will see uh, the summer homes. And I use that, here, here come my air quotes again, uh, the summer homes of the super wealthy, the Vanderbilts and the Hills, the uh, robber barons, the people who own the steel mills and the railroads of the country. Um, their summer homes um, one, of the, one of them that we went through was 136,000 square feet. 136,000 square feet. It was on about five acres of property right on Long Island Sound. Um, it had uh, solid gold um, spigots on the uh, bathtubs and the sinks. They had um, tubs for fresh water and tubs that you could fill with uh, salt water. Um, they, there, there was priceless artwork all over them they, uh, and, and sculpture. Uh, they, they were just unbelievable. And recall that I said these were the summer homes of the super wealthy. These people had so much money they could just buy whatever they wanted. And they made their money on the backs of the, the little guy, the backs of the working people to whom they paid almost nothing and, uh, um, and, and, and had no benefits and no social security and no nothing. Uh, they, they didn't even have income taxes back in those days. And so these people had just had all kinds of money. Um, the system was inherently uh, unfair. And the social gospel people um, rebelled against unbridled capitalism, against laissez-faire capitalism, okay? And uh, they offered a number of s solutions. One of them was the reform of capitalism, a number of different reforms like unionization and benefits and f uh, child labor laws and uh, li limitation on the number of hours that people could work and things like that. Um, but some of them also espoused uh, socialism. They believed that the property of the super wealthy should be taken away from them and shared among all the workers. Well, a as you know, that didn't go anywhere. It was too radical for America. Uh, but the social gospel, at least some of the social gospel people, did advocate for that. Okay. Um, keep in mind also that... Uh, the, the social gospel is an outgrowth of Puritanism. You know, you know by now that Puritanism is not just a strain of religious thought in America. It is, I think, the predominant strain of religious thought in not only Protestant America, but in America uh, as a whole. P one of the tenets of Puritanism was that believers should reform and remake society, rebuild society. Remember I, I've been saying that church and uh, nation, church and world uh, are in constant tension with each other. And so the social gospel picked up on that tenet of Puritanism and, and said that it is the duty of Christians to remake society, to rebuild society. Okay, 
the chief spokesman of the social gospel movement was a gentleman by the name of Walter Rauschenbusch, a theologian. Um, I'm not going to say much about him, but you, you can look him up, or maybe I'll say some more about him when I come back uh, uh, next week. But Walter Rauschenbusch, yes, I'll spell that, R-A-U-S-C-H, E-N, B-U-S-C-H, Walter Rauschenbusch. Okay. The social gospel was primarily concerned with the plight of the people in the cities. They, their concern was for the, the people in the urban cities, the working man, the, the guy stuck in that manufacturing job. As opposed to another movement of the second half of the, sec, of the, of the 19th century called populism. P-O-P-U-L-I-S-M. Populism was concerned with the plight of the farmer. Its chief spokesman was a guy by the name of William Jennings Bryan, uh, a quite interesting uh, gentleman in the history of America. He ran for president. He was called the silver-tongued orator, great speaker. He also was, and we'll find this out next week, one of the litigants in the um, Scopes Monkey Trial. That was his last hurrah, if you've ever seen the movie about the Scopes Monkey Trial. Okay, so Walter Rauschenbusch for the Social Gospel, William Jennings Bryan for the Populist Movement. All right, um, the Social Gospel, I'm just about wrapping up now, the Social Gospel fought hard against America's contempt for poverty. And America's contempt for, for poverty, something which I think uh, exists even today, um, goes back to the Protestant notion that wealth is a sign of God's favor and that if someone is poor, it's because they don't work hard enough, that they're not industrious, that uh, they're somehow lazy, that if you're, if you're poor, it's your own fault. The social gospel tried to fight against that mentality that if you are poor, it's your own fault uh, and that wealth is a sign of God's favor. They didn't get very far, but they at least tried to change that mindset. Okay, uh, last thing. The, some other leaders of the social gospel movement, besides Rauschenbusch, Washington Gladden, Joseph Cook, Edward Bellamy, Henry George. Okay, Henry George, by the way, was uh, one of the uh, principal socialists among the group. All right, so that's the end of part one of the lecture. Um, if you go back to YouTube or the link on um, the, uh, uh, the, the Blackboard, you, uh, whenever you're ready, you can start uh, to view uh, the, the second half of the lecture.